Thank you all so much. What a pleasure it is to be here today. And Dale, it's just an honor to spend the time with you and all of the collected luminaries that are in the audience. And that means really literally every one of you. Um, Local Motors is changing the way you move. Uh, seven years ago, we set out on a quixotic journey. And the journey was to change the things that move people and uh, things around. And so we're on that way, and today we're proud, I think, to be four days into the first vehicle and process that makes that truly manifest. So you'll be able to see it outside. Uh, it's the first direct digitally manufactured car in the world designed by a global community. And uh, you're going to be able to buy that vehicle in less than 12 months. So take that. <laughs> Um, we're about changing the way that you move, and uh, um, and everything that goes into that makes it a challenge. Because even my mother, who knows nothing about automotive engineering, and she knows a lot about a lot of other things, she was a math professor, says, "Doesn't every car need to have a chassis?" And uh, and I said, "What what? No, not every car needs to have a chassis. We need to be a little bit different." Let's see. This is not forwarding for me, so um, can I just ask for the next slide? Would that work, or should I just? Uh, Okay, so while we thank you, Dale. So while we sort that out, so uh, um, we have two parts of the business: co-creation and micromanufacturing, and that's what makes it real for us. So the co-creation part is about gathering the best ideas in the market, and then the micromanufacturing is about making those real. And Peter Thiel is famous for saying, you know, do one thing and do it well. I think he took that from Andrew Carnegie, and I thank you, Dale. I think Andrew Carnegie was famous for saying, I put all my eggs in one basket and I watch that basket really carefully. So he and Peter Thiel are on the same page. And for us, I think we'd love to do that, except for the fact that today's car companies have grown up after 100 years of history where they're really not ready to take everybody's individual idea. And we should understand that as possible because the tools that they've built around them are not ready for anything other than the machine and the supply chain that has been optimized to be able to receive those ideas. So we had to do it all. And I think we means our whole community, not monolithic uh, business like another auto company, but really trying to build something that's more distributed. So for us, it's about three parts. It's about ideas, it's about making, and it's about selling. And that is really how you bring a new vehicle to market. And that's what allows that vehicle that you'll see outside today to be real and for you to be able to purchase it. So it's a big challenge. And we give great thanks to all of the community members and customers that have joined this today so far to make this happen. And it's just on the way up from here. And we're super excited. Massimo just mentioned uh, European Maker Fair. If you're going to be in Rome, you'll see some of the cars over there. And uh, um, we expect to put up 50 microfactory retail points in the next five years. And uh, so we really want to make this a available to people, and I'm going to talk about what are in those. So in the kernel, in the middle of idea, make, and shop for us is this community that, that we steward. And uh, they're made up of fabricators, designers, engineers, and enthusiasts. The best way I would say it is, if you want to sort of couch it, for industrial designers that make cars, um, they're such a rare and special breed. How many car designers do we have in the audience today? Anyone? Anybody designed a car before? There we go, rare and special breed. So there are only about, there are less than a million of them in the world. And so these rare people who are incredibly talented um, meet up with uh, the larger crowd of automotive engineers. Has anybody ever worked on a car program as an automotive engineer in the room? Uh, a little less rare, but nonetheless still rare. And, uh, and then those meet up with fabricators. And has anybody ever wrenched on a car here in the room? And there we go, just slightly less rare. And then who here has watched the show Top Gear? <laughs> and there are our enthusiasts. So you can now see what the community is made up of, and that pretty much is an exact replicant of what you see in the world. So the community is a fantastic group of people who all share the same passion, which is vehicle innovation. And they want to change the way in which people and things get moved around. And so the microfactory is at least one way to be able to make that happen. The data that we have so far is if we utilize it correctly, we can make vehicle innovations from skateboards to Skylabs happen at five times faster and at 100 times less capital. Five times faster and 100 times less capital. And so a microfactory for us is all of those things of idea, make, and shop together. And I'm going to sort of break them down. We are a virtual and physical community. It's sometimes hard to talk at conferences and think about what it means to be virtual and physical if you're only in the open source software movement. So the world of open hardware, as 
pretty much you shouldn't be at Maker Fair if you don't love hardware. But the world of open hardware is not uh, replete everywhere. And I think one person said it best. You know, like uh, I think they said, "I have a uh, there are." 99.99% of the world is not on Twitter. My 10 million followers are the other 0.0001%. So that's the issue that we have with open hardware right now is that we're all in a little club and there's so many people that now just barely understand open software and the whole notion of open is very, very difficult for people to say, why would you want my idea to contribute to something and why would that make that better? and especially if it could kill you when you drive around or kill somebody, somebody else. And I think the best analogy that I like to live with on that is that there was a day where we didn't have an operating system that had an open kernel for people to be able to contribute to. But today, most of the supercomputers of the world, as we all know, run on that open source a based system and uh, we're driving around in cars that have just the same amount of complexity as those original operating systems and they deserve to be incremented much faster and so doing community development of that is important and it needs to be both virtual and physical so the micro factory has an open lab and that's one of the promises that we had that I'm so happy to make good on uh, in the past I worked in China for three years and one of the things that I was so inspired by is that your access to hardware innovation is pretty much unfettered in places like Guangzhou and Shenzhen. And so we didn't want to make it where you had to pay for access. So everywhere we put up a micro factory, there will be free access to the professional tools that we have. Free access to the professional tools that we have. You can walk in, you can get spec, you get a badge, and you can work on vehicle innovation, full stop. So next thing is manufacturing floor. This is where we take the ideas and we don't share tools with the lab. The lab for us is a place where you can use the tools and innovate. The manufacturing floor is a place where we get serious about bringing these products to market. So when you come, it's got a glass wall around it, it looks like a NASCAR race shop, and everything from the 3D printed car to our new bicycle, the Cruiser, and the Verado, which is an electric drift trike, can be found being made in there, and more products to come. And I should say last weekend we did the first international Pikes Peak downhill race event with the Verado and about 70 other Hooners that wanted to see what it took to go down Pikes Peak on a Verado. So depending upon which micro factory you go to, there is more engagement for how we use the products. And then the last piece is the shop. If you've been to Knoxville, you'll see the first example of our retail shops that are out in the public. It's in Market Square right in downtown. And over the next year, you'll see more of these pop up where you can actually go on foot traffic wise, not even have to drive to one of our micro factories and be able to buy the vehicle innovations that come from the micro factories. So check it out if you're in Knoxville or in downtown Las Vegas. And uh, soon we will add one in the cities where we are going each place where we put a micro factory. So these are the kinds of vehicle innovations that come up. And when people ask, what is Local Motors good at? They used to say, well, you made a rally fighter, so you must be an off-road car company. Or you made a racer, so you must be a motorcycle company. Or you made a cruiser, you must be a bicycle company. It's almost like somebody once said that if you were on an island and had never seen a ship before, and a ship showed up on the horizon, would you know what the ship was? People are not used to seeing multiple vehicle lines from one company. And that's what you're going to see in the future as we distribute production and make things happen. So we make cars, but we're not a car company. And we make motorcycles, but we're not a motorcycle company. We are a vehicle innovation community that is powered by micro factory production. So the bottom line, the way I like to think about it, is it's maker plus crowdsourcing plus retail all grown up. Maker plus crowdsourcing plus retail all grown up. Some details for this that I'd like to say is if you want to compare to what this looks like between like the Tesla or between the Fisker Karma or between the Chevy Volt, we like to say that the bottom line is faster and less cost because of more brain power. And then the fourth piece is, and I sort of go across faster, we're about five times faster, about a hundred times less capital to bring the first 25 vehicles out. That's what this means because we bring more people to work on a specific project. But the other part, for those of you that are, that are doubtful about the way this happens, is we can't build as many vehicles. So while Tesla could build 100,000 vehicles out of its factory, out of each one of our factories, we could probably do 2,000 vehicles. But if our factory costs less than 50 times the amount of uh, money it takes to put up a Tesla factory, then those economics are good for spreading innovation all around the world. So faster, less cost because of more brain power, but you have a greater scope of what you can do one factory to the next. 
None of that would be possible unless you could do things digitally because you need to be able to make the same Springfield repeating rifle in one place as you make in another place. And that's just not that simple with the car and that's why we've been doing this for seven years to get there. So the case study for us on the 3D printed car you're going to see on the outside is design a vehicle that radically reduces part count. That was our challenge. It wasn't design a two-seater or design a slow vehicle or a fast vehicle or a pickup truck. It was let's get rid of parts because what we were vectored in on is we wanted to make it uber simple to put this vehicle together. And when I say that, we wanted to take the 20,000 parts we put in a rally fighter and turn it into 50 parts that we put in this car outside. So for any of you that are outside with me at the time, I'll go ahead and count each one of those 50 parts. But the goal is for less than one man hour when we're at laminar flow to be able to put the car together or deconstruct it. One hour that two people could come together and put it in. So that would be, excuse me, a half hour to put it in one man hour with two people. We're not there yet, but I can easily see how we can get there for the components we have. There are only 50 of them. So at four weeks, 207 projects and 30 countries represented all competing to design the first vehicle to be made in the direct digital manufacturing process. And the result is the Strati, which you see outside, which was designed by a young Italian man, Michele Anoe. He came to the United States for the first time last week with his boss. And I'm so proud to say this. He works in a vehicle design firm. So if you don't think that you can be a professional and take part in our community, find a better boss because his boss came with him. That was awesome. They designed for Fiat, they designed for Aprilia, they designed for some amazing companies, but he was so proud of his designer because he won the right to have the first 3D printed car that he needed to be there in Chicago with him and hand him a handshake while he got a check from us for building this car. And he'll get a check for every vehicle that we sell that's in the Strati line. So making the 3D printed car will happen in the microfactory and we can talk through it and selling it will happen also. Our vision of the way in which you'll shop for a direct digitally manufactured car is you will choose from a portfolio of vehicles that come from this rare category of designers. Unfortunately, since none of them are in the audience with us today, you'll have to take the ones that have already been designed by the ones that are online already. But that will allow you to go in and, in a sense, customize your vehicle buying experience, where you can go in, follow online, decide which one you really love, establish a relationship with that designer and say, I'm going to vote with my money to make you the person that gets the check for what we're doing. That is awesome. So uh, um, the shop for us is about selling the future. It's about prosuming. It's a version of crowdfunding, if you will. I've often thought that crowdfunding has been around for 100 years or really for 80 years because the automotive industry started it. They said, if you like this car, we'll build it for you. That's what the auto shows were about. They would show you the technology that's about to come out and they would take deposits for those vehicles. They would take full checks. That's crowdfunding. It's just that we've decided that cars are difficult to make and so we don't think of it as crowdfunding anymore. But it's coming back in that way and it's coming back strongly. This product, the Verado, that just did the first international Pikes Peak run was crowdfunded. It was crowdfunded in the local motors community and it was done in 48 hours. We funded the entire development of this product, which is a super cool product with a supply chain in and of itself. And we did it all with our customers. All the people that wanted to own the Verado put up the dollars to be able to make this possible. And that's about trust. If we weren't a company that could actually make this happen, then I don't think they would trust giving us their money to be able to have that product delivered on time. And we delivered 100 Verados a week ahead of schedule. That's awesome. So um, moving through really fast, what you'll see from us is you'll see more products that will come out in the shop and you will see more things that are going to be done in a direct digital manufactured way. That for me is making good, making manifest the promise that we have. This is what it looks like when you're on the inside of the shop and I encourage you all to come and see it. The next one that we're going to have up is going to be in Berlin starting at the end of 2014. So uh, um, the next promise there is 100 of these in 10 years, 50 in the next five years. And that's the way we can bring idea, make, shop all together in order to be able to make this real. So uh, the last point I wanted to say today before I get off stage is that um, a lot of people asked us early on, why just vehicles? And I would look and be, that's super crazy. I mean, it's a $2 trillion industry that uses 70% of our oil end use. Why not just vehicles? But the chorus of those people has been pretty loud in my ears and, uh, um, and GE approached us a while back and said, we are a manufacturer 
and we would like to change the way in which we pick the products that we put into the world. Could you, prod, could you work with one of our divisions to be able to make that happen? And I think that GE has been a leader in so many things, but one of the things is being humble about the way they do product development. So you're going to hear later today from Taylor Dawson, and he's representing First Build. First Build is a collaboration between Local Motors and GE. And it is a way to think about co-creation and micromanufacturing for the appliances that you have in your home. And I encourage you to check out firstbuild.com and also go see their microfactory in Louisville, Kentucky, because it is the future of where big home appliances, the things like the white gear that you have around and the white gear you haven't even imagined yet, are going to come out of. And I think they have some tricks up their sleeve that are going to be incredible as we go forward. And you're going to see some things that we previously thought of as banal in the home that weren't that interesting that are going to come out and are going to really wow you. And you should take part in it because it is the future of distributed manufacturing and product production or production of new projects that are coming out in your home. So uh, maybe for those people that didn't want it to be just vehicles, this can go into other places. And we're so happy to partner with GE and other future partners to be able to make this work. So come see the car outside. I'll be here all day to talk about it. This is one of my most favorite times of the year when Maker Faire happens. There are a couple times of the year if you think about all the mini Maker Faires that are out there. And it's just a pleasure to share it all with you today and with our global community. So thank you.